important about Christ is that Christ is our peace. Christ is our peace. That's who Christ is. He is the one who has come to bring peace. Not only to us as individuals, but peace to all creation in the reconciliation of all things to God through the cross. And so God's plan for humanity is not that there should be fragmentation and alienation and hostility of people against one another, but that all people should be united as one and reconciled to God through the cross. I don't know whether you're aware, but last weekend in Glasgow, we were in Glasgow shopping in the afternoon, uh, looking for Advent calendars for the children as it happens, and uh, we, we saw <coughs> police everywhere. Police were everywhere. And there were police helicopters buzzing overheads. Uh, and there was this sense of tension in the city. And we, as a family, we didn't have a clue what was going on, but we knew that there was something happening. And it was only when we got home later and put the uh, seat facts on to, to see what was going on that we were aware that there were two big marches in Glasgow last weekend. And one was by the National Party of Scotland, which is campaigning as you know, in order to make Britain for the British, and what they mean is really for the whites, and, and to exclude asylum seekers and, and people who are different. And also in Glasgow, there was a march by the anti-fascist league, who were against those who would have such a policy. And reflecting on this afterwards, it, it just brought home to me, once again, the fragmentation of our society today. And the way that people are so against one another and becoming more so, it seems. And maybe sometimes we're aware of, of the breakdown of community that there is around us where we live. We see that in Erskine where we are. Sometimes the young people who make the older people feel very afraid and the older people who seem just to be, uh, you know, stifling to the younger people. And people against one another. Maybe you're aware sometimes the conflict in our own homes. And as a pastor, sometimes we see those kind of situations, and maybe you're aware of them. Maybe it's what you bring to church this morning. Maybe sometimes we're aware of the conflict even in our own hearts and in our own lives. So we feel divided against ourselves as we struggle with what, knowing what we are and what we long to be. And into, into the midst of all of that, fragmentation of our world and our lives and our community. This word the Apostle Paul speaks loudly to us that Christ is our peace. Christ is the point at which God is building peace in our world today. What, what scripture means by peace is not merely just an absence of conflict. Not just the quietness, when we think about situations of war, not just the quietness that, that, that comes after the noise of the guns is stilled, just the hostility is ceased, peace reigns, or, or the peace that you know that you long for sometimes as a parent, when the children are in bed and, and all of the hassle and the chaos of the day is over and, and suddenly it goes quiet and you slump into the sofa. Peace. At last, calm descends. That is a wonderful peace. It really is. But when the Bible talks about peace, and when it talks about the peace that Christ has brought into the world, it's talking about much more than just the absence of conflict and strife and chaos. It talks about the, the peace of shalom, that beautiful Hebrew word that tries to express the wholeness of life and, and the fullness of life that God longs for us to know in relationship with himself. Not just the absence of conflict, but the positive sense of well-being, of healing and wholeness, of restoration, <coughs> of good things that God longs for us to know. This, one of the things I often think about when I'm thinking about the peace that God wants to give us, 
God wants us to know in our, in our lives and in our community together. Uh, one of the things I think about is, is a visit I made to Brazil a couple of years ago, and I was interested to see that you have a missionary too out in Brazil. And uh, when I was the pastor at Kirk and Tullock, uh, we had a couple who were working out in Sao Paulo, just near the racetrack as it happens at Interlagos. And, uh, I, I was asked if I would go out and, and see Robert and Silvana and see how they were doing and take a gift to them from the church. And uh, I went out to visit them there. It was one of the great uh, thrills of the visit, actually, was to go and stand on the racetrack uh, at Interlagos and even to walk around it. It was absolutely wonderful. What wasn't quite so wonderful, in a sense, was to go and see where they are working in one of the favelas in a, in a community called San George. There, there in Sao Paulo. And uh, Robert took me to see the work that they were doing, and you, you go into this favela, this, this sort of township of ramshackle huts and houses that people have built who've come in from the countryside looking for work and looking for a better future. And you access it off the street through a, a little door in a concrete wall. And as you pass through this doorway, you enter into another world, a world that I could not have imagined in my wildest dreams. You go in, there's these narrow alleyways, little huts and houses built out of cardboard and wood and corrugated iron, just jammed against one another. Thousands of people living right on top of each other in this tiny space. And running right through the middle of this is this, well, it was a river once, now it's just an open slope. So it foul. The smell, you know, turns your stomach. And we walked around and met some of the folks there in the, in the favela there at San George. And one of the things that struck me was that there were no men to be seen anywhere. And I waited till we left the favela after our visit. And I, the first thing I said to Robert was, Robert, where are the men? There are no men. Really? <coughs> Children everywhere, no men. And he said, well, the tragedy here in this place is that a couple of years ago, he said, oh, as a result of a drugs dispute here in St. George, men came into to this township and shot dead every one of the men. The husbands, grandfathers, all the men were shot. And the purpose of that was not just a reprisal about a drugs dispute, but was also to reduce the women and the children almost to slavery to these drugs bands who then have free reign in the place. It's a pretty lawless place to be. And it's a heartbreaking situation. And you see the children running around with those shoes on in these very poor clothes with, with so little to live on. I said, well, how do these people survive? And he said, well, for this community, the Christian believers in the area decided that the shooting of these men and the destruction of so many lives would not be the last word in this place. It would not be the last word for these children and these women but that we would commit ourselves to come and to help them. And so they've gone into that place and they've helped these women and children to set up cottage type industries, to make small amounts of money, tiny, small amounts of money, but just enough so that they can get by without having to have recourse to taking debt or doing other things for these drug barons. They went in and they built a wall alongside of this open sewer they can't clean it or can't change it, but at least they've put a barrier there which stops the tiny children falling into this, this open sewer and catching hepatitis and all sorts of things. And they go in regularly and they paint people's houses and they bring food stuff and clothes and do what they can. And to me this was an overwhelming experience in many ways, but it symbolised what the Bible talks about when it says about peace is not just merely the calm when the guns have stopped firing, but it is that restoration. It is that building up again 
of goodness and wholeness and